Hello, everybody. Uh, today, I want to have a discussion about the user experience of command line interfaces. And uh, as you stated, uh, these are commonly the first touch point a developer has with your product. Uh, and this touch point matters because you want someone to start using your product, get to adoption, get to revenue. Uh, we're all building businesses here. And the main premise I want to share with you today is that you should start treating your CLI like an API. And if you think back to one of the most coveted developer tools, it's the API for a lot of good reasons. All of you are using an API. Uh, and so I want to talk about the best practices of bringing those, uh, those quick wins over to your CLI. Uh, and you know, there's not a lot of best practices uh, out in the world about uh, how do I start getting, uh, building a CLI? How do I adapt it with new features? Uh, my business is going to grow. We're going to have uh, increased scope. And how do I make sure that the user experience of doing this uh, is great day one, day 30, uh, day 600, day 900? Uh, and that's what I want to cover today. A uh, little bit about CoreOS uh, to frame this talk. Uh, we make software for turning a bunch of Linux machines into a smart data center. Uh, this means that we build a lot of software, uh, including all the way down at the bottom, we actually make our own Linux distribution called CoreOS Linux. And then we build a bunch of software tools on top for uh, clustering and failover, deploying software, that type of thing. Uh, and so we have a lot of experience shipping CLIs. Uh, most server operating systems you know, are SSH based only, so you're just dealing with text. Um, so the CLIs are how we engage with our developers. And CoreOS has one interesting property, which is that we do automatic updates of the OS. Just like your uh, browser updates and you have new features, you have security fixes, um, we do the same thing for the server operating system. And uh, this is a little bit crazy, uh, but we've had a lot of success with it. And it really shapes the way that we develop our CLIs to make uh, this process work. If we're not being forwards compatible and backwards compatible at the same time, uh, you know, this process doesn't work. Uh, we're just going to cause pain for our customers, uh, and then the business folds. Uh, obviously, that's not our desired outcome. So what we do is we treat our CLIs like APIs uh, and all the great things that those APIs have. Um, so, you have, uh, whoops. Uh, so you have your architects, and they really care about, uh, they sweat the HTTP verbs that they're using, the terms that you're using on your CLIs or your APIs, uh, and you need to bring all of that over to your CLIs. Uh, and so treat your CLI like an API. So we have a bunch of designers in the room, dev evangelists in the room. Uh, so why do you care about your CLIs? Uh, I hope this is kind of obvious to you, but you know, this is the first touch point that you have with somebody. And what you want to do is use that to delight uh, so that you can insert yourself into somebody's critical business flow, um, a critical path that makes them money. Uh, that means that you have uh, power over them because you can start charging them for some of that value that you're providing. And so I call this the critical path. This is where you want to be. This is where you want your tool to be. Everybody here is building businesses around something. Uh, and what you need to do is, is reflect on uh, something that you're going to do for your user. You're not the first step in that workflow. You're not the last step in that workflow. Uh, but you're somewhere in between. And if somebody's critical business process is going to be built around your piece of software and it fails with you, uh, they're not going to be happy. They're either going to go to one of, their one of your competitors or uh, even worse, just uh, stop investigating this entire realm of what their software is going to do. And so what you want to do is have a great user experience, which is going to get you to quick adoption, and then hopefully to revenue. Uh, but before you get to all that good stuff, uh, you need to be embedded in that developer's workflow, and you need to build their trust. Remember, this is a critical business process. It doesn't matter what you're building. If you're speeding up someone's code compilation, uh, video transcoding, whatever it is that you're doing in this workflow, somebody's building their business around it. And just like a great API, uh, you want to make sure that you can answer one question for your users. In, do I feel good about building my business against this API, putting it in this critical path? Um, obviously, everybody has said yes to this. We have these flourishing APIs uh, with things like Twilio and Amazon Web Services, all these things. Uh, so people are used to this. And you can build on this to get the adoption of your CLI as well. And great APIs, when you think about it, uh, they have really strong versioning schemes. Um, they uh, have plans for backwards compatibility. You can break this if you're careful about it. Um, they're planning for greater scope over time. So as they build their business out, there's going to be more functionality added. Uh, this is generally going to increase scope. There's more parameters, more access control, that type of thing. Um, and then when they do remove a feature, they have a plan for it. Um, it's very well shared with you so that, once again, you can answer that question of, do I feel really good about building my business on this piece of software? So what that means for you is you need to design your CLI like an API to have all these benefits in there, uh, as well as some other best practices that we're going to talk about. Um, and put the same amount of love that your arch architects put into your APIs 
into your CLIs. And since there are a lot of designers in the room, uh, also the same amount of love that you put into your UIs as well. Uh, before we jump into some best practices, I want to step back and just do a very, very brief history of kind of uh, Unix and how we got here. Um, and so if you think about the 1970s, all these uh, interfaces were text-based out of necessity. We didn't even have any graphical environments. Uh, and all these pieces of software that were designed to just make computers function uh, all started gravitating towards a, towards a set of principles. Uh, and the main one is really the Unix philosophy. If you've never run across this, this underpins kind of all modern computing at a CLI level. And this is do one thing and do it well. And this is really well exemplified by the process of browsing a file system on Linux. Uh, if you think about it, you want to explore, uh, so you'd use ls to list some files in a directory. Uh, then if, say, you wanted to make a new directory, you would use the make dir command. Uh, and even the names of these programs exemplify how focused they are. Um, you can imagine exactly what they do. And then if you were going to insert this into a larger, more advanced workflow, you would string some of these commands together. Uh, this is kind of how all of our modern uh, tooling works today uh, at the low levels. If you, you know, on OS X and you're messing around with your terminal, um, you get access to all of this, but on top of this beautiful UI. Uh, the server ecosystem kind of strips away that, obviously, and so what you're left with are these CLIs that everybody's building their businesses against. Now, the Unix philosophy has aged pretty well. Um, like I said, it still underpins a lot of uh, the operating systems that we use. But today, users expect full solutions, which is naturally going to increase your CLI scope. Uh, now, what this means is uh, you're, you want something like Dropbox. You're searching for this magical folder, and it syncs files around, and you're really happy about that. But what you're not looking for is running a daemon to do like revision control, uh, one to do access control. You're not thinking about all these things. Uh, what you want is just your magical file system uh, that syncs files around. Uh, this is what users come to expect these days. And what this means for you as a CLI, uh, either designer or developer, is that it's going to increase your scope. There's going to be more configuration flags. There's going to be more parameters. There's going to be more features. Uh, and you just have to tackle these uh, and make sure your user experience is crisp. The second major thing is that all of our tools these days are talking to these remote data sources. Um, things have grown up in the cloud. Uh, you're always going to be talking to an Amazon API or you're storing files somewhere. And this means that you have to deal with the access controls that they enforce on you, uh, error handling uh, when connectivity is down. Um, and it's just going to be really, really tough. Uh, but you as a designer have to tackle this complexity uh, and build this into your CLI. The second major difference is that everybody loves knobs to tweak. We have a lot of uh, performance-related things you want to change, uh, things like role-based access control, uh, different parameters for shipping things off to different regions. Um, all these things are kind of inherent in all of the CLIs that we're working with today. And once again, this naturally is going to increase your scope as well. What I like to do is call these cloud native. These are tools that have grown up on the cloud with all of these uh, things that we just talked about. They're talking to remote data sources. Uh, we're able to ship software faster. We have tighter release cycles. Um, all these things, these are very cloud native. And they feel a little bit different than our classic Unix processes. And there's really two phases uh, to adopting these tools. Uh, the first one is the out-of-box experience. Uh, this is what probably everybody in the room is concentrating on if you're in the first quadrant we talked about earlier. Uh, you, know, you just want things to be easy to understand, easy to download, easy to configure, so that you can get somebody up and running. And you want to get inside of that critical business process so you can start extracting value uh, and, and showing your value. And what this means is uh, the actual CLI commands need to use industry terms. Uh, just be really understandable, but then you can start building trust uh, with your release notes, for example. Remember, you want somebody to ask, uh, can I build my business against this CLI, against this piece of software? And if your release notes are crisp, uh, they're put out in a very regular cadence, uh, you can start building that trust. Now, the trust becomes even more important over time. So you've inserted yourself into somebody's critical business process, and uh, what you want to do is prove to them that you can earn that spot and stay there. This is things like uh, versioning and backwards compatibility, uh, always being able to script against an API. If you think about a workflow, you're not step one and you're not the last step. Uh, somewhere in between, somebody's doing something else with some other pieces of software. That means that they're going to be scripting against your CLI. And if that breaks, it, it grinds the whole thing to a halt. Somebody stops uh, making money off their business. They're angry at you. Uh, that's not anything that anybody in this room wants. And then. Uh, Going forward, you're always going to have to upgrade software. You're always going to be releasing new features. So you want this process to be as smooth as possible. 
Uh, you want to document what that looks like, uh, practice executing it, make sure it's uh, up to date with your documentation and it's very easy to do such that you can keep providing value to folks, fix bugs, ship new features, um, but not mess up that critical business process. And now I want to move into some best practices in an, uh, kind of a segment I call living in the critical path. Uh, this is a lot of uh, lessons that we've learned at CoreOS from shipping software for three years. Uh, and I want to reflect for a moment and just reiterate that you're not in control of your software anymore. It's, uh, if you're on CoreOS, uh, sometimes your software is automatically updated and you get all these great benefits, security, new features. Um, but then if you're using these uh, modern day package managers, they create these crazy dependency trees. Other people are putting this stuff together and you don't know if one of your versions of your CLI is pinned to an old version because there's a dependency that wants that and not the other. Um, this is just a whole headache but you can uh, prove your trust and get folks to always be using the latest versions of your software if you prove to them that when they upgrade it, it's going to be fine, it's going to be smooth, and you've got these documented processes for how it works. The first best practice I want to talk about are flags. Um, this is a huge part of a CLI. This is how a user provides input into your system. And the best thing you can do is choose a really secure, common, smart default. Um, this kind of seems like a no-brainer, but it's kind of the building block on how do you build a great experience. Uh, I'm sure everybody is familiar with this CLI. This is the MySQL command line interface. Um, and the two commands that I'm showing up here are actually identical. Uh, the, the second one shows the default flags and their default options. Um, and that's things like talking over localhost instead of a remote data source. Uh, this represents a very common use case. Somebody on a, uh, jumps onto a server to debug something or a developer is in uh, localhost mode and uh, they're just talking to a database on their machine. Uh, and then something like the port, this is a very common port. Uh, it's the IANA standard for MySQL. Um, but just thinking along these lines of what are the flags that my user has to uh, provide to get up and running? Can I set a default such that they don't actually have to provide those flags at all? Uh, this is going to get you into that critical business process a little bit quicker. The second example is from a piece of software that CoreOS makes uh, called Rocket. And what Rocket does is downloads software from the internet and runs it in a special way, uh, something that we call a container. Uh, if uh, you're very familiar with Docker, this is the same type of concept. And uh, these two options, uh, or these two command line examples, once again, are the same. Uh, the options that we're providing on the bottom are the start, uh, smart defaults that we've chosen to be the most secure. Uh, and you can see that we have a uh, property called insecure options. Uh, this is a flag that's very well named. You know exactly what this does. Uh, this is going to drop some security options uh, if you configure to do so. Uh, smart default for this is obviously none. Uh, the second one is another security option, uh, trust keys from HTTPS. What this means is we're going to uh, verify some of the software before we run it, best practice, uh, and you can choose how we get those keys to do that. Um, these are two kind of no-brainer options uh, among many other defaults in Rocket, um, but I want to call this out because we didn't nail this experience at first, and some of the best practices that we've developed uh, kind of help us avoid this situation in the future. Uh, Building on that, uh, you need to think about forward compatibility from the beginning. Uh, we all have pretty young startups here, and so you're naturally going to have more features, you're going to increase your scope, uh, you're going to fix bugs, and if you construct your CLI smartly from the beginning, you can solve a lot of these problems downstream and feel really good about updating your software uh, with your new features, get that value. Uh, so I mentioned that we screwed this up at first at Rocket, uh, and what we had before is this top example up here which is uh, this flag called insecure skip verify. And what this does is skips the verification step uh, when you download a piece of software from the internet. Um, what's unstated here is actually it skips a whole variety of steps uh, and methods for communicating this. And we found that this wasn't granular enough for folks. Uh, so what we had to do is what you see on the bottom here, which is uh, switch to this insecure options uh, flag, which is really a, a common separated list of these options that you can drop. And what we did for backwards compatibility is to uh, make this uh, second command that you're looking at identical to the first command. So we removed this feature, uh, we renamed it, but we aliased that command to the same code path uh, going forward so that new folks are going to use the documented version, which is this new flag. But uh, if old folks upgraded, uh, their old flags are still enabled to work. Uh, the, when they're scripting this process, everything goes fine. Uh, and the third example you see up here is now how we've uh, made this flag forward compatible, we can add new options to this. Uh, so if we have more granular security concerns, uh, we can just keep adding on to this. 
We don't break old scripts. We give everybody the power for the new scripts. It's kind of the best of both worlds. Uh, the next few are going to talk about this concept of a CLI API contract. And what this means is scripting against your CLI should always be possible. Remember, we're in this workflow. You're not step one. You're not step 30. You're somewhere in the middle. Uh, and someone needs to use a scripting language to get through that. And what you want to do is make sure that this is always possible across upgrades. And then realize one important thing is that this is an API contract, but it's not one that has strong versioning. They're not hitting v2 of some HTTP endpoint. Uh, they're just using your CLI. And so uh, you need to be very, very careful about deprecating flags and features uh, to work in this type of system. An example of this is Kubernetes. Uh, this is a clustering uh, software that CoreOS runs. And we're looking at a series of jobs running on the cluster right here. Uh, you can see there's tables. It's a table. There's uh, columns for the unique name of the job, the status, its age, that type of thing. Um, even this table right here is an unstated API contract. Uh, if you were to reorder some of these uh, um, columns, or if you're going to change the type of the output inside of this, if we change the status into something a little bit different, um, you're going to break somebody's script. The ex uh, second example on the screen is you know, somebody doing some bash foo to get this unique name of a job out. So you search for a string, you manipulate that string a little bit, and out pops what you actually want. And then you can use this in the second part of your workflow. You can script against this. If you change anything about this without being smart about it and thinking about it from the beginning, you're going to break everything. Inside of this critical business process, people start losing money. The second part of this uh, CLI API contract is recognizing that you have two different users for your scripts. You have the humans that are going to be playing around with things, and then you have the computers that just want this thing to work and work the same way every time. Uh, and so you can provide configuration parameters for them in different ways. Users love flags. Uh, so when they're exploring your uh, piece of software, they download it, they start typing flags, they're changing parameters, they're figuring out what exactly it does. Uh, this is a really great experience, help you get up and running very quickly. Uh, but computers don't do that. Uh, you can provide environment variables for these computers. Um, a lot of configuration management software uh, works with environment variables. It's kind of the, you're going to win over the operational folks with this. A great example of this is a piece of software that we produce called etcd. This is a clustered database. And here you can see that we're listening on a few different URLs, and you need to provide that configuration. Uh, what we've done on the top is provide these with command line flags. Uh, this is a user that's trying out etcd for the first time, and they're configuring some things. Uh, and on the second, we're uh, doing the exact same thing, but with environment variables. And if you look really closely, you can see that a best practice is to name your environment variables and your flags very, very, very similarly. This means that when somebody's playing around, and they're done, uh, and they've got the configuration that they want, they can convert this to a script. It's a no-brainer. Um, they can just follow the same documentation that they're already looking at. And we've done another cool thing, which is prefix these with etcd underscore. This is so that you're not configuring uh, against somebody else's environment variables on the system. If you have two different pieces of software, they're going to conflict. Uh, once again, this is going to halt the whole critical uh, business process, start losing somebody some money. This is what etcd looks like when it starts up. Uh, this is the log. And you can see the first few log entries are actually just outputting the environment variables that it's recognized and their values. This can help your support team. When somebody sends you a log, you're not sure how somebody configured this stuff, because as we uh, said before, there's a lot of knobs to tweak. Everybody wants to do all these things. Uh, but you can't support that very easily. Uh, here you can see exactly what somebody did, and then your support team can easily fix the issue very quickly. Now, if you look at this very, very closely, you can see I actually made a typo in this log. Uh, and etcd is calling it out as an unrecognized environment variable. Because we're using the same prefix, etcd can look for every single instance of that prefix. And then for here, example, I misspelled the word name. And so this parameter is not getting picked up. Your support team can easily look for this. And this can be kind of like their first triage into helping out somebody. Uh, and then also users can do this themselves once they get used to this workflow. The last topic on this kind of hidden contract is that you need to require, uh, return info required for the next step in somebody's workflow. Uh, this is commonly creating a unique, unique item, and it has a unique ID. Uh, and this serves as a way to confirm that it was created successfully and then allow you to operate that on the next step of a workflow. Uh, and we have a bunch of examples of that on the screen. Uh, the first one is kubectl. This is our clustering software. And so this is creating a new job on our cluster, and it has a unique ID. You might want this to start and stop that job, edit this job, change something about it. The second one is one you might be familiar with, which is Docker. 
uh, we're running an Ubuntu container, just like we were with Rocket earlier. And uh, this has a unique ID as well. You might want to manipulate this to stop the container, start the container, that type of thing. And the last example is etcd. Uh, so etcd has uh, a CLI called etcd CTL. And this is adding a new member to our distributed database. Uh, say we need to uh, increase the size of the storage or resiliency, whatever we're looking for, um, we're adding a new member. And you can see that not only do we output the unique ID of this, but we also output the environment variables needed to uh, start this up. And this is what you would put into your script. Um, this is a nice little UX win that's just going to increase that out-of-box experience, make somebody feel good about this software, um, especially when you're winning over ops teams. They're probably the ones that are going to be adding this capacity. Second one is a little bit uh, more in the UX realm, uh, which is just a traditional information architecture exercise. What you want to do is balance the scope of your CLI uh, with discoverability of all these features. So when somebody first downloads your application, you want them to get oriented very quickly as to the breadth of services that you provide, but then hone in on one or two that they can start to integrate into their workflow. Uh, I made up a fake example for this called Prezo. Uh, this is an example application that just uh, makes slides, edits slides, apply templates to them, that type of thing. And uh, these two commands are actually identical. This is adding a new slide uh, to our presentation, but there's two different ways of doing it. The top one is what I call primary command style, and this is having just a single list of all the commands that you can run. Uh, so we can imagine that there's add slide and edit slide, et cetera, uh, all in one giant list. The second one is subcommand style, and this is uh, grouping some of the common uh, actions for slides under uh, the slide command, and then having subcommands for add, delete, edit, uh, that type of thing. And where this matters is when you're looking at help output for one of your commands. Uh, here we can see we're just looking at the generic help output, and we see a list of all the commands. Right here, there are five of them, kind of what I described. Uh, you can present, et cetera. Uh, but imagine if your piece of software has five commands now, uh, and then next release you add five more commands. Uh, then a year from now, you're up to 30. Uh, this is obviously unsustainable. It's alphabetical. It's not grouped by anything that means anything to your users. Um, they have to search through this every time. It's kind of painful, but it's great for starting out. This is the help output of the second method, subcommands. Uh, and you can see that we only have three commands now that really uh, describe our, what our application does, what it solves for users. Uh, and this is manipulating slides, uh, presenting our slide deck, and then applying templates, maybe editing templates. And if you wanted to look into any of these pieces of functionality, you would just look at the specific help output of that command. Um, you're in the namespace of what you're kind of looking at, the problem you're trying to solve. It'll be much easier to take in. And the great news is if you liked that first idea uh, and you know, you're maybe not ready to commit to the second, you can actually transition between these very easily, but you can't go the opposite direction. Uh, you can alias these commands such that if somebody calls add slide, it hits the same code path as slide add and you're good to go. Uh, going the opposite way is not as easy based on how flags are parsed and commands are parsed, that type of thing. And remember, what you're doing with this entire thing is you're trying to build trust. You want somebody to ask that question of, can I build my business against this piece of software, against this CLI, and am I going to feel good about it? And every single touch point from the minute that they download that software uh, till they get it integrated in their entire business and you're running their entire business, uh, you want to build that trust. This is about updates. It's about documentation. Um, all that good stuff that really uh, comes together to form a really great experience. I want to talk about open source CLIs uh, just for a second because these are very uh, kind of unique because any user from the internet can now start modifying your user experience. Somebody submits a pull request to change a default, add a parameter, drop a parameter, add a command, change the way something works. Uh, and you know, unless you stay on top of this stuff, uh, you have no control. You start uh, eroding your user experience and then you know, you screw up somebody's business process once, and you know, they say, oh, that's, that's the risk we took, where maybe this is a new startup, uh, you know, that's gonna happen. You do it again, they don't feel so good. You do it a third time, and you know, they're looking at your competitors, they're gonna rip you out of this critical business process. Um, obviously nothing that you want, you wanna increase that adoption, uh, get that best user experience, and get to revenue. So I hope you've seen how you should not just uh, have a CLI, but you need to design your CLI like an API for all these reasons, forward compatibility, backwards compatibility, and really optimizing for getting inside of that workflow, that critical business process of a developer, such that you can start extracting value from that company because you're providing value to them. Remember, 
Add as much love to your CLI as you do to your UIs, your APIs, every other piece of your business. Um, because for developer-focused products, this is how you sell them. This is how you worm your way into that company. And then you can build on that relationship up and up and up. Thank you. <laughs>